Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Maurice. I'm going to be your, your host, which means that I just get to go over a few of the ground rules and then let you get here for what you really wanted to hear about, uh, which is International Policy 101. Uh, like I said, uh, we're going to start this off uh, by letting you know that this is going to be on the record. Uh, so uh, that is going to be streamed out. And uh, you know, make sure that if you uh, don't want to be on camera, you take note of the camera behind you. Um, as we're um, going to be hearing from our, our panelists today, uh, they're going to go through, introduce themselves, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. Also, at the end of the session, there is going to be a feedback slide, so you can go ahead and scan the QR code, let us know what you thought about it. Uh, during the session, please keep in mind, if you have anything that beeps, makes any fun noises, put that on silence, uh, so that way uh, we, we don't all hear it. And then lastly, um, as a reminder, if you are standing up, please try to find a seat. If not, keep the, the, uh, the hallways clear as best we can. And with that, uh, let's go ahead and start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maurice, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, welcome to DEF CON. Uh, it's fantastic to be here, great opportunity to share, and um, we've got a wonderful panel uh, to talk through uh, international cyber security policy work. Um, just a few things from our side. Um, we have uh, allocated about um, one hour, 20 minutes for the kind of component of it, the on the record component, and the intention will be that that will enable people to come and ask questions afterwards and have a kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation if that's helpful. Um, of course, happy to be flexible, make the most of time, but also that's the, that's the intention. Um, so what we're going to do is just start with a few personal introductions. Um, you know, really excited to be here. Um, so my name is Peter Stevens, uh, and I'm at the OECD, which is... Uh, thank you. Um, uh, that wasn't expected, but, but greatly appreciated. Um, uh, so it's an international uh, organization based in Paris, um, which uh, supports 30 member state countries uh, on a range of policy issues. Um, as you can maybe tell from my accent, pri previously I was based in the United Kingdom, where I worked in the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, and I led the uh, Secure by Design Policy Initiative, so the work on IoT security was, was my area. Um, so it's great to be here, and what I'll do is just pass down, um, and then we can, we'll have a start of conversation. Hi all, my name's Adam Dobell, I work for the Australian Government uh, at the Embassy in DC, and my job is to engage with the US Government uh, and the industry on uh, cybersecurity policy. Hi there, uh, Peter Brown, I work with the European Parliament, I'm a career civil servant there since 1990, although I did take a uh, 10 year sabbatical working in the private sector. Um, I lead on tech policy for the what I call the Eat Your Own Dog Food Service, which is where we examine within the parliament how policy that we're adopting politically actually will have an impact within the IT services in the parliament. So we're sort of stuck between policy and operations. Um, hi everyone, it's great to be here. My name is Bryony Crown and I lead on all things cyber policy in the embassy in DC for the British government. But similar to Adam, also lead on all things cyber policy with the US and industry. I'm Ari, I'm Ari Schwartz, I'm managing director of uh, cybersecurity services at Venable. I also uh, run the uh, Center for Cybersecurity Policy and Law. And uh, previously in the Obama administration, I was uh, in the National Security Council. Thank you so much. Um, and we're really hoping to have an interactive session as well. Um, so please do feel free to, to continue to ask questions. As I said, there will be an opportunity at the end uh, for, for off the record conversations as well. But um, if you want to, to raise questions, then please feel free to do so. Um, so you know, what I'd also like the intention from this session is that everyone leaves with an understanding of what the key priorities are, um, what people, uh, different countries are working on. Um, and, and how we can make sure that we're continuing to inform uh, one another of, of our work as it progresses. So, you know, the way that we were thinking about uh, framing this conversation was to kind of think through the various challenges that cybersecurity uh, policymakers have been facing. First of all, in creating their own identity, um, and, you know, it's had to be generated very quickly, um, and then how that has translated into challenges of sort of securing existing technologies, um, and then moving into challenges that have been, you know, how we can learn from that experiences to make sure that we're more resilient, became more capable of addressing these issues. And then in the future, also for touching upon um, cyber workforce and cyber security, so skills agenda as well as an, as an area of, of interest. So I think for, for me, one area that I'm particularly interested in is how we can be helping to like, play catch up. I think uh, an area that, um, in my experience in DCMS, that we had was, particularly in light of the Mirai botnet attack, 
was thinking about, okay, we, now I've got so many of these IoT devices that are being used by, by businesses and by individuals across the United Kingdom and, of course, across the world. And we had to kind of retrofit security into those forms of technology. And that was a real challenge of how we can you know, create this approach where you know, working in policy is a particular way of operating and which often relies on sort of lengthy consultation processes, long engagement um, with various stakeholders, you know, and lots of ministerial engagement or um, lots of hierarchical processes. It can be often, confu often, I mean, we can all agree, not as fast as the private sector in terms of how it can operate. But then there's been a question of how we can learn quickly to try and make the best impact we can within those areas of technologies. So, um, you know, I think that that comes into this secure by design approach that quite often gets referred to. Um, so I suppose what I'd love to really talk about is um, maybe start with Bryony, um, understanding a bit more about some of the work that's been taking on in the UK, um, and also uh, so you can talk through both on the PSTI bill, but also a bit more um, uh, on Telco. Cool. Thank you very much. So just to start a bit about Secure by Design, because I feel like in UK government we've talked about Secure by Design for quite a, few, uh, quite a long time now. So talking about what that actually means is about how we want to secure technology and data sharing uh, uh, systems on a uh, Secure by Default basis, which basically means that we're not retrofitting and we're not doing a security as an add-on. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the analogies we talk about um, having seatbelts in cars, making sure that as you know, if we have seatbelts, there's le less deaths. We, I'm sure people have also heard about that if we have uh, with aeroplanes that we used to have square windows, which meant there was pressure on the corners, which, which led to m m many more deaths. Now we have circular windows, which means that they're secure by default and means uh, it's much more safe. So that's something that we. Uh, I think that's something that's how we need to think about, particularly, well, I'm sure we're going to talk more about AI and this, or how we need to approach that. Um, but what we recognise is that we can talk a lot about that, but it's actually that's really difficult for industry. It costs money, it costs time, you want to go quick to market, it's really, really difficult. So actually how we work together to make that as uh, enforceable and easy as possible is how we can actually achieve that. So in April, uh, we issued some guidance with a lot of countries, with Australia, with the, the US, and a number of other partners, uh, a bit of a roadmap of how, you can act, how companies can do that. And that's meant to be some really uh, sort of easy, enforceable steps. This isn't rocket science, what we're talking about. This is about not having default passwords. This is about things that, that should be being done by practice. Um, but sometimes that's really difficult when people are not uh, thinking about security, as you know, because you want to go quickly into the market. Um, so we're doing that via a, a variety of initiatives and I know there's a listening session with CISA later to go through some of that guidance line by line and get some um, feedback. Uh, but some of the things that we're doing in the UK uh, to enforce that is uh, with our Product Security Act, uh, which was brought into force um, at the end of last year and will be made law by April next year. Um, that's about uh, consumer devices. Uh, and what we've done is take this much a very evidence-based approach. So this was taking evidence from our National Cyber Security Centre to look at where is, do we see the most threat and where can we do things that make the most impact. And that's by three steps. So one is not having default passwords, one is having a mechanism to report vulnerabilities, and the third one is the, the manufacturer to be transparent about how long that, um, that de device will be updated for. Um, the really great thing about this legislation is that it can be updated. This is very much seen as the initial raising of that resilience, uh, but it was something that we would, can potentially look to build upon in the years to come. And I'm sure we'll go talk a bit more about the CRA, um, but there's something we see as something that is very much um, in, in partnership and something that we will see to be, um, that we will continue to assess and see how both those bits of legislation grow. Uh, the second bit of legislation uh, which came into force uh, almost two years ago now is the Telecoms um, Security Act. Uh, this is really to recognise that telecoms and networks are the backbone of what, how we manage our everyday lives. And we talk a lot about in the UK about making the UK the safest place to live and work online. And this was seen as the backbone of how we do that. And there was a ton of work that went into inform that work about we had um, diversification strategy, we had um, what we're looking at there is the network, we're um, most uh, vulnerable to threat. And so this is, like I say, a very evidence-based approach. And the aim of that legislation is to raise the resilience of networks and to make sure that they, uh, there is actually the most threat, are, are, are resilient as much as possible. So that's something that we're really proud of in the UK. We've still got a long way to go. We haven't fixed everything, but it's something that to us, those two, two areas is something that seems a real key of how we can raise the overall security of the UK and, and indeed the world. I think that's, I mean, 
it's amazing to hear about, and I think something that may be interesting for participants who may be not familiar with the intricacies of UK parliamentary law is there's sort of there's the distinction between primary legislation and secondary legislation. And in both cases, those bills are what we call primary legislation, which means it's on the statute book as an independent piece of legislation, which takes a long time to get implemented because there's a lot of parliamentary time that goes into that process. So the, 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 the competition internally to, to secure a spot in the Queen's speech, which generates the kind of which, where the, all of the, um, what bills that will be introduced, uh, that is very competitive. But once you're on that statute book, it becomes much easier to add regulation. So actually, in, in terms of creating the capacity to be more adaptable, there is a distinction between the primary and the secondary. And that's, I'm sure that may be in other countries as well, but I think that's a really important part for both the PSTI bill and the Telco Security Bill um, is an important distinction. And I think, helpfully, as you know, a big challenge that I think legislation faces is how can it make, you know, how do you avoid it becoming obsolete by, as soon as you become implemented because as technology moves so quickly, um, it, that's very difficult. So my hope is that by having that process and that engagement with industry and that engagement with security communities, you're able to make sure you're fit for purpose in that way. So yeah, I think that's, a, a, but that's an important point as well, definitely. Um, Adam, do you want to talk a bit more about uh, some of the things that have been going on in Australia on that side? Sure, and um, I'll start um, by outlining Australia's position in our region. Um, in 2017, um, in recognition of the deteriorated geostrategic environment, we found ourselves, the Australian government made a decision to introduce legislation which would require our telecommunications companies to not have vendor equipment in their networks uh, that came from countries which were uh, subject to extradition, uh, territorial uh, direction. Um, then we went on a journey over the next uh, few years to outline what we consider to be critical infrastructure assets. And so we have required through legislation um, that would, uh, was introduced in 2018, and we've defined 11 sectors. Within that, there's 22 asset classes. And those, uh, those assets are required to report to the Australian government um, their asset holdings, their ownership structure, so we get an understanding of which countries have uh, the ability to direct operations in Australia critical infrastructure. They're also required to uh, mandatorily report cyber incidents in the same way that the US is developing CECIA, going through the rulemaking process for CECIA. It's a, it's a very similar um, uh, mandatory reporting obligation and the timeframes are, uh, are very much aligned. The next element of that is a, is a requirement uh, to develop a risk management plan. And as part of that risk management plan, cybersecurity cyber is a critical element and we are requiring uh, entities to develop a plan that uses an internationally recognised framework. So NIST is one of those frameworks that we allow our asset providers to use. Um, we also have um, designated um, some assets to be systems of national significance. Uh, so you might have heard in the US there's, there was, has been consideration of introducing legislation that would designate systems uh, uh, system, SICI or systems of uh, critical uh, importance. And so we've done that for 82 different asset classes. So we've outlined uh, 950 assets that we consider to be critical infrastructure and a subset of that which we consider to be systems of national significance. There's 82 of those. So we are working with those assets, uh, uh, those operators, um, to put in place incident response plans. They'll also exercise with relevant agencies, including our Australian Cyber Security Centre. Um, they will be required to provide systems information where, where necessary. We also have um, another obligation under the legis legislation, which is allows for government assistance measures. So that would allow our government to direct an asset to do a certain thing, or in extremist, in a case of a near wartime uh, environment, we would direct an asset to do something and potentially take on responsibility of their, their system. So we have, we've seen the situation in our region deteriorate. We understand that there's significant risk to them. And we're on this journey uh, to build the resilience of our critical infrastructure. It's in its infancy. We've just this month, we'll be introducing the risk management plan. So. We're yet to do a full analysis of what it looks like and how it has improved the resilience of our critical infrastructure in Australia. 
But I mean, I think that's, thank you very much. And I know that there's you know, a lot of different frameworks that are taking place and under consultation as well. Um, and Peter, I know that there's been a lot of work that's been going on in the European Union, in the Parliament, um, the Cyber Resilience Act, um, and also you know, other, other pieces, big piece of legislation there, which have, you know, it'd look great to hear your views, particularly on that process of, of, of catching up on those existing technologies. Sure. Um, yeah, so firstly, just as a preliminary remark, the, it's important to understand the way the European Union is established. It legislates in areas where individual member states within the Euro Union have given it authority to work together on behalf of all of the member states. Um, Technically, there is no reference in any of the EU treaties to cybersecurity being a policy area that the EU is allowed to work on. So there's been some sort of delicate footwork over the last 10 years to try and identify areas where um, the European Union can act. Uh, we've had NIS and NIS 2, the two cybersecurity acts, which uh, established and improved um, the European Agency for Cybersecurity, ANISA. Um, and there's also with the Cyber Resilience Act, particularly, um, given a basis for um, legislating on issues regarding um, a sort of common approach across the European Union for market in for the market of um, uh, sale and availability of goods which have um, cybersecurity um, implications. Uh, the reason I mention that is because a lot of things like um, critical infrastructure, for example, are exclusively national competences of which the European Union um, doesn't it itself have um, any competence except for um, on a coordination basis. I think in terms of the substance of legislative work, uh, we've taken what we call a sort of ecosystem approach, recognizing that this increasingly complex ecosystem of devices, services, interfaces between digital systems and the real world, um, the data that's driving and feeding those systems, um, the software, the algorithms, the learning models and everything else, together represent a, both an opportunity and a threat and a risk to uh, having real world impacts either to, to citizens, to infrastructure, to, to, to people and services in the real world. And that sort of ecosystem approach under, underpins the work that's being put forward in the Cyber Resilience Act which itself is one piece of legislation alongside others that have gone through this current legislature of the Parliament, including um, NIS 2, the EIDAS, uh, uh, which is the um, European e-identity um, scheme, the uh, AI Act, the Data Act, the Data Governance Act, uh, and, and various other pieces of, of, of primary legislation coming out of the EU. I won't go into all of those because it's just a vast area, but just pick out a few points uh, of relevance, I think, for on the Cyber uh, Resilience Act. Um, despite its name, um, it's really looking at that domain of connected devices. The lawyers deliberately didn't want to talk specifically about IoT, um, but it's the, again, it's that sort of part of that broader ecosystem of the interfaces with the real world and the services and systems and software behind those that directly interact with um, those actuator sensors and IoT devices. Um, the general approach, which I think Brian mentioned as well from the UK government um, uh, approach, is uh, largely a risk-based one where we've classified different products and services on the market according to an initial evaluation of what the risk levels are. Uh, the lowest risk being you're good with, 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 what's, with, with your product as it is at the moment. We then have sort of two regulated classes, the class one products and services, which are those which are considered lower risk, but nonetheless present a risk, which is where we are looking for what will be called the um, European Union uh, Declaration of Conformity, so similar to the SDOC that you see in a number of other countries. And then the class two, which is the higher risk, which requires um, a third party um, certified conformity assessment, uh, conformity assessment to be done. Um, the, the act itself is broken down into an er areas covering the security requirements, uh, sort of minimum um, security requirements, and I think they're very, very similar to, to um, uh, the, the, the UK government's uh, approach there. Um, requiring that products come on uh, the market are secure and 
patchable and patched through the life, the de declared life cycle of the product. So if someone says, uh, we think this product's going to be on the market for 10 years, they've got to, they've got to um, assess, a, a test to and have an assessment that their products are indeed being uh, maintained, patched, updated, or whatever, for the, for the entirety of that um, life cycle. Um, that no product comes onto the, uh, I have to say this with a straight face in this audience and in this event, but um, must come onto the market with no uh, exploitable vulnerabilities. Um, good luck with enforcing <laughs> that one. Um, exploitable vulnerabilities, not exploited, known exploited vulnerabilities. But um, as a political statement, it's a, it's a good starting point to, uh, to come from. Um, interestingly, and I think this is where there's a bit of a difference and we move ahead of um, legislatures elsewhere in the world, is two things about updates and patching. Uh, one is requiring manufacturers to have two paths for updates, one for security updates and one for functional updates. Um, allowing and actually by default ensuring that security updates are on by default and don't require user consent, whereas functional updates should be separated out and, and have a, a possibility for the user of the device or service to determine whether or not to um, update the, the functionality, but to separate the two out. And I think that's an interesting uh, element, whether it's, again, whether it'll uh, t uh, hold to the, you know, the test of time, we'll, we will see. Um, the second one is, the idea of, and I think many of us have seen that in operational environments where you want to sort of default back to a, a factory reset, you, you're not sure about the vulnerability of something, so you want to go back to a, a starting point, um, and, but requiring that you can do a factory reset together with all of the security updates that have been implemented up to date. So you may be able to uh, have a situation where a product has been securely and safely updated and those updates are, the, the security updates are maintained, but you want to default back to um, the original settings for many of the other aspects. And I think that's, um, uh, that was another inter interesting aspect. The other thing is, unlike in cybersecurity legislation elsewhere, um, and because of that bigger ecosystem that I talked about, um, cyber, the, the Cyber Resilience Act also covers issues about confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the data and uh, requirements that data, particularly personal data, is compliant with the, uh, the, the, the more well-known GDPR, the, uh, the data protection uh, regulation of the EU, um, but also a number of rules governing um, the use of, um, uh, use of data um, by those devices and by services uh, around those devices. Um, I think I'll leave it there at this stage. I mean, say so broader conversation. Do you, so one thing for me is interesting is that is the relationship on the just on the IoT side, also yeah. the role of standards and how they face into the right. Would that be interesting. Yeah, to indeed. So when I mentioned about the class one and class two products, the class two products are the ones which require a conformity assessment. And to do the conformity assessment, you need to have standards against which you're making um, an assessment and doing a certification. Um, the problem we have there, and it's both a sort of geopolitical battle as well as a um, purely standards technical battle, is there isn't really a lot that in the standards world that we can base ourselves on as a starting point. And what they've taken is, okay, there is a European standard, the ETSI 303645, which I think other people have referenced. But beyond that, the and this isn't a issue limited to the Cyber Resilience Act, it's more a general principle about EU legislation, that when standards and conformity assessment are required, there is a very laborious and Eurocentric approach to standardization, which requires firstly that the European standards bodies are given instructions to do a sort of survey of what standards may be in place and uh, available to that conform with or that align with the requirements of a particular piece of legislation, only then determining whether there are international standards through ISO, IC, ITU, um, that fulfill the requirements of the legislation. Um, but more often than not, um, we see, and it's a practice that the European Parliament has been trying to push back a bit on, which is the European Commission, as our executive branch, sort of defaults, uh, it's sort of knee-jerk, a reaction is if we need standards we go immediately to the European Standards Body and create something new which may already have been <laughs> created or established elsewhere. So 
there are some, as I say, some geopolitics involved in that. It's yep. not just purely um, technical issues. I think it's, it's really interesting on the standards bodies because that's something that, again, that the UK government, when, when it was helping to deliver the Product Security to Help Communicate Infrastructure Act, was helping to think about how it can recognise and refer to existing technical standards um, to, and to make sure that they are embedded or referred to in the, in the way that the regulation is drafted. And of course, to make sure those are then updatable, um, because you know, to try and resolve an issue where you just refer to something which has become obsolete. And I think within the standards body, something that I've, I've seen on IoT specifically is a lot of organisations are starting to map out the relationship between the existing standard bodies and the outcome and the sort of the terms within it. So it's to, so to try and diffuse some of that geopolitical issue yeah. where people feel like, okay, we have to go with this one because it has this particular association and actually trying to move to saying, well, actually there's, there's kind of universal consensus around these particular points. Um, and that I think is something that is a view that we're looking to aim towards as sort of uh, helping on that front. Yeah, and I think um, just to round out that, the. I'm speaking you know, purely in a personal capacity here as someone who's been working in standards work as well about the last 30 years. Um, standards are not a tool for regulation. They can help underpin it, um, but neither are they, are they an alternative to regulation. For me, I've always seen sort of standards being a sort of bedrock foundation on which regulation, um, business to business agreements and other sorts of uh, deals can be done where you're, you're agreeing a common basis to do that. What we've seen historically is for a lot of areas of legislation in the European Union, um, standards have been developed as a tool to implement legislation rather than being seen, uh, rather than looking at the sort of panoply of, of standards available and say, well, actually, the requirements in this standard or this standard meet 90% of our requirements, so we don't need to go out and build something new. And for the 10% that's missing, we will do whatever's necessary to build that up. And trying to get into that mindset of, using and reusing existing standards is becoming increasingly important in that international cooperation. I haven't mentioned about it, but the Trade and Technology Council, which is a big co political cooperation between the EU and the US, one of the streams of that work, and we've seen that elsewhere in Quad Alliance, in APEC, in, in um, the um, India, UA, uh, EU, uh, Trade and Technology uh, Environment and others, is recognizing that if you're going to trade and improve um, the markets across those um, geopolitical boundaries, it, it's easy to do that if you're working on, on the added basis of conforming to agreed and common standards which everybody's using. I think there's another thing just on that point, and we will move on, I promise, but um, just on the, uh, the role of recommendations from international organizations. So I know this is something which Again, it's not there's the role of technical standards, and there's also, particularly for countries not for the United Kingdom but for others as well, is how can we, how can international organisations play a role to help kind of share good practice recommendations that can then be used by, com by countries that don't have necessarily the same level of cyber capacity. So you know the OECD recently published a series of recommendations around management of vulnerabilities and also on the management of, of product security. Um, uh, so those have been helpful in terms of they've gone through a process where they've been ratified by the 38 member states um, and of course they, they don't go into technical detail that you would expect in, in a technical standard but it is a helpful sort of starting point and a helpful tool mm. to share in terms of that capacity building for countries maybe where you don't have the, the level of resource that you would have in say the United Kingdom or the European Union or the United States or, or Australia um, and I know that Ari has done a huge amount of work as well um, in, his, in his role um, with, with Latin American countries. We know, of course, that Costa Rica had a devastating attack in the not too distant um, past. Um, and it would be really helpful, Ari, if you could share um, some of your insights uh, working in Latin America. And then also you were saying that in Kenya and Africa as well. It would be fantastic to hear from you as well. Yeah, I, I, um, I first want to comment on this point that on the, yeah, I use this term, uh, countries that have... Uh, um, less capacity, and uh, I think it's important to point out like, that that's not always Latin, just Latin America or African countries. I mean, uh, when I was in government, um, I, we met with the uh, Norwegian military, and uh, the uh, one of the lead civilians there said, "You know, I don't think you guys realize how much impact you guys actually have on the rest of the world when you put out a new policy." And I said, yeah, no, we really think about what issues we want to lead on and how we do it. She said, no, are you really, when you put out a policy, we translate that policy directly into Norwegian, and then we take the cover page off, 
and we put our cover page on, and that's our policy, right? And I think that that, I mean, I think the UK has some of that impact as well, and Australia probably regionally. That's what the EU wants, right? That's the kind of impact the EU wants, and that's part of the standards, the, the geopolitical kind of uh, overview here. But, I mean, US is usually standardizing before and then bringing it to the international arena and then uh, pointing to an international standard in most cases, um, which is what, one of the reasons the EU wants to work around it, but we, we can go into some of that more later on. But um, I think that that's you know, some of the idea here. But that's Norway, right? Norway's a very wealthy country. Yep. Um, they just don't have this capacity to, to have the kind of policies that the UK, the US, Australia do. And, and, and maybe Germany, you know, France, some of, the, some of the EU countries do. Um, so which is, which is interesting in that way. And I think that they, uh, you know, we have seen Latin America basically do a, take a similar approach to some of these things, especially as it relates to what they tell their agencies to do. But then the agencies themselves don't have the ability to follow those policies that US agencies do. So they have these policies like uh, you know, Mexico uh, put together, it's, uh, and, and Brazil both put together uh, cyber strategies over the years, and they're very detailed, and they look a lot like the U.S. Uh, strategies do, uh, but do they have the ability to implement them? And so we've seen these countries do that. Usually, um, and, and this is kind of the big trend in the region, is usually cybersecurity has been run out of the ICT unit, which might do regulation and internal controls, or the uh, CIO's office you know, a, C, a, federal CIO, a federal CIO for federal agencies. Um, and that, that's who runs it. Um, Costa Rica had that, this huge breach uh, last year, um, which was a, a ransomware attack, shut down the government. The, um, it was like right at the time of the presidential election. It was a total disaster for the country. They still have not recovered. There's still, a lot of the agencies are still offline. Um, the US gave them $25 million uh, and a plan that came from MITRE and Carnegie Mellon about how to, re how to respond to it, and uh, they're still working their way through that in Costa Rica right now. Uh, $25 million has turned out not to be enough for them, even, even with that, to go forward. Um, they just don't have the internal expertise to be able to deal with this kind of situation. Um, and we're seeing that uh, other places in Latin, that re really um, made, had a big impact in the rest of Latin America. Um, Mexico also last year had, a, had an incident, uh, which they call a, uh, Guacamaya uh, um, bre uh, breach, and that the, that led the president there basically to say the same, say publicly, we just don't have the expertise in the country, um, which is something that a lot of people that that a lot of us that have worked with Mexico knew, uh, but they had not been admitted publicly before. They want to now build a cybersecurity agency there. We see the same thing in Brazil, as I said, where they want to where, where there's talk about uh, there's legislation to do a, to have a, a cybersecurity agency. Um, uh, Colombia also is talking about building a new cybersecurity agency in a similar way. Uh, it has not passed yet. People thought that it was going to, and it did not get to, to that point. But Chile seems to be the first that actually is going to get it through and uh, move forward with that idea. Will it work for them? You know, we hope that it will help them bring a, more of a workforce and, and a you know, structured approach to it that's not just a kind of follow-on to IT, IT management. Right, that is, some people are looking at this from a real true security point of view and bringing in and building a workforce uh, that can do the work inside the country. Um, so I think that's the, what we're seeing in the region. There's other trends too, but I think that's the one that uh, is probably makes the most sense to go over since we've seen so many, aid, so many different countries now uh, take, that, take that same path. Um, Africa is, is not in the same place. I mean, uh, that we have seen, um, uh, Recently, um, this year, Kenya had a, uh, an incident um, that they had a lot of trouble recovering from as well. There's still some signs, signs that they are, uh, um, there's some signs that they're past it at this point, but it took them a long time to get to there. And they're like the most advanced. Uh, I want to say number one, I, I don't have a ranking to go by here uh, of African countries, but are the ones that we've worked with. The one, they're, they're very, very high up, very, and have more of a workforce than other African countries do. But yet they haven't been able to respond to this incident and they were not prepared for it. Um, other African countries not prepared at all. Um, so we're hoping that the, the kind of the, uh, you know, silver lining from the 
Kenyans are similar to what we saw in Costa Rica, that there can be this kind of public uh, awakening uh, around this from, from the politicians on, the, on this, that they, can, that they need to put more um, resources around, or, or, and, and in this case, ask Europe and, US, and the US for uh, resources to be able to help them uh, build cyber defenses um, the same way that they ask uh, to build physical defenses. So that's where we are. Thanks, Larry. I, mean, I think you I mean, raised really important points about the importance of kind of, of, of workforce strategy and, and the, or the of workforce issues and how country, how important it is for countries to have that pipeline of, of expertise to be able to build resilience within the country. And I think um, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that a bit later. And I think also in terms of your point about strategies being beautiful and generated and you know a very nice document, but then in terms of the implementation within that, difficult to track, again, which comes back to the expertise point, but also how, how do we make sure that, you know, I think if countries are now getting to a point of recognizing the important role of having a national cybersecurity strategy, how can we make sure that they, they, have, they continue to have impact and don't become a kind of beautiful document which sits on right. the shelf? It's, I mean, one, one thing that's important is I, I think there was a time in 2017 when Mexico was, had the federal police right there strategy, and it was very, very militaristic. The first draft was very militaristic and um, made a lot of people really uncomfortable inside the country, especially because they had had so many problems with activists and, and, the, and going after activists and uh, a lot of concern over it. Um, and they came and they, they redid, they, to give them some credit, they redid it and they actually went and they looked at other strategies around the world and how they did it and, and made it so that it was focused on engaging industry and did a, a, there was a study of, at the time, that was done looking at industry, what, what industry looked like in Mexico and where they needed to improve. But I still think that in the end, that strategy was still something that was unrealistic for them to implement, yeah. given the workforce, which goes to your point. Yeah. So, okay. And I think, so bringing it back now to the UK, Australia, and, and Europe, um, I think, of, of course, there's been a lot of work that's been happening, a lot of sort of development of these capacity, a lot of work, you know, creating. When I joined the cyber team in DCMS, I think there was sort of 30 people, and by the time I left, it was about 200. So you know, you saw a huge growth in the in the level of, of resource needed to help work on these different initiatives that were taking place, um, and I think you know that we now have a position where it is a recognised area within many government operations, is a recognised policy function, um, and and it has a sort of series of roles which are being called out and updated through a series of strategies. Um, so what I'd love to do is just talk through maybe you know as we stand now, um, what we see as the most important policy considerations for for, the, for this year, and, and for you know of course we've got. A lot of technologies that we're probably going to talk about, um, uh, including artificial intelligence. So we'd love to hear your insights on, on that front. So, Adam, can I start with you on that one? Sure, and I, I might go back a step and just, just sorry. Could I ask you, please, to keep the mic to, to keep the microphones closer to the speakers? If it's more than about eight inches away from you, you're in heavy competition every time the door <laughs> opens, and it's hard to hear. Thank you. That's that's good advice. Um, so I might just go back uh, and give some context as to what we've seen in Australia the last year, year and a half. Um, we, uh, late last year, suffered two significant data breaches. Um, the scale which affected uh, the personal data of about 10 million Australians. So they were an attack on our second largest uh, telecommunication company and our largest healthcare provider. And that was a seminal moment in the way that Australians think about cyber and data security. Um, in the same way that I think Colonial Pipeline was in this country. It also was politically seismic and meant that we, for the first time now, have a cybersecurity minister within our uh, cabinet, um, so at the highest levels of government. Um, and we've gone through a review which essentially found that um, in Australia, at a macro level, industry faces a maze of uh, unclear regulation and government doesn't provide the type of clear, direct directives as to how to best uplift their cybersecurity, um, nor does it clarify obligations on data security and classify what is considered to be the most sensitive data that um, organisations in Australia hold. So that all bring, brings us to the point also where we recognise that there's not uh, the genuine bi-directional uh, information exchange that we do need to ensure that industry in Australia has the right type of visibility of the threat it faces. That brings us to the point where we now are developing a new cyber strategy. To Ari's point, we've been monitoring developments in the US very closely, and fundamentally in Australia, we are philosophically aligned with the new US strategy. We recognise the status quo cannot endure, 
and we need to um, undertake the two fundamental shifts which are outlined in the US strategy. So that's moving the burden to those who can best uh, take on the risk, and secondly, incentivising long-term investments. Unlike other countries, Australia does have the capability to move quickly and let on legislation, and also the capability to deliver on um, our, our stated goals. So we're hoping that we can actually go further in, in terms of implementation than the US can by virtue of the legislation that we'll, we'll introduce. But I might stop it there and let um, Bryony. Thanks, Adam. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the UK published its um, cybersecurity strategy uh, about a year and a half ago. So, hopefully, a useful blueprint for the US and Australia. Um, but what that, the whole message of that strategy was that this is a whole of uh, society effort. We can't do it alone in government. We can't do it alone in industry. We can't do it alone in academia. We have to do this all together. And where the tagline that we talk a lot about in the UK is to make the UK the safest place to live and work online. What this strategy recognises that this is not about the UK anymore, this is about the world, because obviously, as everyone knows, we can't just bipartisan just work one part of the, of the UK. Um, but obviously a strategy is only, you know, it's all very well and good, but it's not worth the paper it's written on unless you actually do it and actually carry it out. And so I know the US have done a brilliant implementation plan. I'm sure Australia will do something similar. Um, but that is something that we're really actively taking forwards. Um, what I know, we talked a bit about the priorities for the future, Peter. Um, so for us is uh, the horrible term of emerging technology. And we won't go into the debate of what's emerged and what's emerging. Um, but you know, for us, there are two broad buckets of we have technologies we need to care about today, and then ones that are in the future that we still need to care about, but we need to think about putting that the, the security principles in place. So the ones we're really focused on at the moment in the UK uh, today is AI, and I'm sure we'll go on to talk about that a bit more in detail, but also quantum and semiconductors, and there's lots of different areas we could, I could go on and on about. Um, but it's something that the way we're taking really seriously, and that's something that's really front and centre of how we uh, implement. And going back to what I was talking about earlier about secure by default, is there something that is very much the, the, the core of how we're approaching those technologies and making sure that that security approach is embedded right from the start and something that we're looking to take, how we're going to take forwards. So I, I mentioned that the CRA was part of a broader package of different pieces of legislation, which um, one advantage we have, I think, um, as, as, a, as a national parliament, as a, as a European parliament compared with, um, with others, is that there is an agreed sort of legislative program over a full five-year um, period um, where the European Commission is responsible for drafting and, and putting uh, legislation um, on the conveyor belt and where, where, where Parliament together with the member states represented in the European Council uh, have the final say in that uh, legislation. So we're coming towards the end of the legislature, there'll be uh, elections next year and I'll come back to that because that's another relevant point uh, in a moment. But um, So in that whole period we've, we've had the Cyber Resilience Act, we are pretty far along now with the Artificial Intelligence Act as well, um, which has been um, after, I think it was 7,300 amendments um, tabled, um, uh, discussed and de debated within the European Parliament to get to a compromise where we now have a solid negotiating position. And even that's not the end of the, end of the story because we, Parliament has its position, the European Council has its, and we have to sort of now reconcile those two uh, versions. But there is... Um, there is um, the, 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 the legislature's sort of feet are being held to the fire very much because um, under EU, uh, our internal rules, any legislation which isn't passed and adopted by the end of the legislature, our last legislative session being in May next year, falls away. So even if however advanced the draft is, and it's not uh, been written into law, um, you, you go back to you, you go back to square one. So there's a there's a real push to get um, all of these pieces of legislation through. Um, in terms of challenges for the next year, then I mean I mentioned the election uh, coming up. Um, European Union, um, the European Parliament, which then is um, plays an important role in the the uh, nomination and final confirmation of the European Commission. Um, is a, it's a five year process. Um, in the US, you've got a two-year um, co congressional process for um, uh, 
the election of the whole House and a third of the Senate over a, over a complete six-year period, and the presidential elections over a four-year period. So anyone who can do the maths sees that the, the common denominator there is 20. So every 20 years, we have the same year, we have the same, uh, we have the elections of the European Parliament at the same year as the US uh, presidential and congressional elections. So 2024 is going to be a big year for us because of the issue of disinformation and election um, integrity and election security. Uh, this is requiring already quite a massive mobilization, uh, both within the institutions in terms of cyber policy, in terms of policy, operational um, cyber uh, policy. Um, we face, uh, or we're trying to face that with a severe skill shortage. Um, in a situation where budgets are limited, where it's difficult to get any new um, staff for any institution, just to give you a, a sort of flavor of the importance of it for us, um, of the total complement of new posts that can be filled and have you know, bums on seats and actually doing the work, um, something like 55% of all new posts are in the field of cybersecurity across all the European institutions. Um, so it's, it's seen as one of the most important growth areas. However, and I'll be the first to admit this, the sort of people we want to attract to those jobs, not that interested in working as career bureaucrats uh, like myself. Yeah, I'm dressing down. This is my idea of dressing down. Um, so we've got to find, we've got to be realistic to find talent that will work for us in an environment where they're comfortable. I mean, the career structure isn't attractive for people who are involved in cybersecurity. The salary, at least the, the initial starting salaries, may look relatively attractive. But for people who are used to, to a high degree of autonomy, to be driven by clear objectives and wins over short periods of time, uh, the flexibility of where and how they work, off, you know, from the starting point, uh, we're, not an, we're not an attractive proposition for people um, in the field of cybersecurity, and we, we, we recognise that. And um, part of the problem we have is where, for most posts that come available for recruitment, we have a ratio of something like um, four to five hundred candidates per post. We are down to a situation where we're barely getting the, the number of candidates for uh, the number of posts available in the cybersecurity field. So we've got a problem. And we recognize it, we're addressing it. And at the moment, the way we're addressing it is through third parties. So we're using contracted um, uh, service providers who themselves can then take people on on a much more flexible basis and, and uh, have sort of service level agreements with us in terms of what they deliver. And that's proving useful and is patching or yeah, both literally and figuratively patching some of the problems we have in terms of um, capability. Um, but as a long-term solution, it, it, it doesn't work. Our um, public procurement rules are also lengthy and clunky and you know, having contractors on board and having them recruit people according to certain criteria, it's a very complex process. So um, the appeal there, I think, is to recognize that um, it's, it's not a sort of come and serve your country of appeal that, uh, that the US or other countries can, can offer to, um, to hackers, analysts and others in, in, in the field that would not normally look at these as career opportunities. But we are appealing because of the attacks of, uh, against the parliament, because it stood up uh, in support of Ukraine uh, against the uh, Russian aggression. We provided practical support for the uh, Ukrainian parliament and we're paying the price in terms of an uptick in attacks against our infrastructure. Uh, we are starting to ramp up this issue about appealing to public conscience, also saying this is not just about defending a grey, distant bureaucratic institution, it's about de defending the integrity of the democratic process and of el elections generally. And that's, yeah. I'd say on those yeah. Thank you, Peter. And I think definitely keen for us to have a conversation about um, uh, about skills because it definitely it's coming through as something which, as we're facing future challenges, uh, how are we preparing ourselves for them? Um, so perhaps Ari, I mean, what I'd love to talk. You spoke briefly about the the the, the effectiveness of Mexico, like adapting its approach in light of feedback. 
um, in terms of developing a strategy. And I think, that, like, there are lots of tired tropes about what it's like working in the bureaucracy, what it's like working in government. Um, you know, I'd love to say they're all untrue. Um, you can still watch episodes of Yes Minister and meh, it's kind of, I think people would agree it's still there. Um, but I think, you know, it's, there, is, there has been, I feel, I have felt like an adaptive approach of how we can be more outcome focused, how we can prioritize the areas which, you know, make the biggest impact on the, the objective in the UK's case to make the UK the safest place to work and be online. But I'd love your, your thoughts yeah. maybe some examples. So one thing, I mean, the, U, the UK has done a great job, NTSC, where you used to work, uh, has done a great job in terms of the consultations. If, if anything, let's say like sort of, if, uh, maybe, maybe we've been deluged with, with consultations, like deluged by transparency from the, U, from the UK, which I'd much prefer over the opposite. So uh, I don't mean that as a criticism, but it does get hard if there's five consultations at the same time for the same people, because it's the, like, even in the US, it's like we don't have that many cyber policy, full-time cyber policy people commenting. So I think spacing them out is, is uh, helpful, but also understand like you have politicians that want to get stuff done mm. now. So it, that becomes harder. We're starting to see that in the US. We're probably gonna have three RFIs in the US um, in, the, in the next two, within the next two months, there's one now, now that's gonna be extended. Um, so, you know, I think, I think we're gonna, we're expecting to have three that we have to comment on there. So it's a similar situation that, um, I think it's great though, because the RFI and the consultation process leads to a much better um, first draft of a product, policy product or legislation, than, um, than what we would have otherwise. So. Um, uh, obviously, I prefer them to be spaced out, but that would be good. I'd say Australia does a very good job as well. I mean, Australia has reached out to us, and I know has reached out to a lot of other people um, when they put something out that they feel like this is something we need to get attention to. Like, we don't want to surprise anybody when this is happening. Uh, Adam does a particularly good job of it, so it's, it's, it, I can praise him on the panel. Um, but I think, uh, you know, they've had us testify and set the time for the testimony in a way that we could actually testify, which like most countries don't want foreigners to testify and they're like actually, you know, purposely seeking it out and asking for it. So that's really helpful. Um, the EU, you know, not, not uh, it, the, it, the structure is Byzantine in the first place. So it's hard to, like, if you're not actually in Brussels, uh, um, I think it's very difficult to figure out even where things are. And the commission does not reach out that way. Parliament does. I mean, members of Parliament come on tours and they want input. Um, so, so that's helpful. And I'd say even the, um, the uh, council member, the council staff, uh, when you go visit, uh, really does too want input. Uh, the problem with Parliament is that they have a lot of issues and the members themselves are not educated at all on what they're voting on or what they're doing and things come through quickly. And so only if, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of equivalent to Congress, actually. I'd say um, the con Congressional U.S. Congress staff um, now with like the tech fellows and stuff like that are probably a little bit better educated than the, than the, uh, the elected members staff. And then the elected members are about the same, maybe worse in the U.S., uh, but uh, depending on who it is. Because a lot of times you get young people in European Parliament that are rising stars, and then they know a lot, and they're very, um, they want to engage on these issues, but it, it is complicated. And even just that you have these three places to go to, and uh, the commission sort of puts you off for a little while, and then you have like a very short period <laughs> to say something, and then it's, they're like, oh, now we can't make any changes. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it, it is uh, unlike other places, and it, uh, um, so that has been difficult to, um, I don't know if that answered the question, but it kind of gives you the... <laughs> well, I, I enjoy the reference of deluge by consultation because I, I definitely feel as though what's been effective for me has been like to be able to be transparent with, with communities and say, no, we, we do read and we do actually engage with what you share with us. And there's, we try to adapt the format to make it not overly burdensome so it's not just you have to have a government affairs division in order to yeah. fill this in, but like you can contribute your insight like in the in in the U.S., sometimes you'll get something from an agency that is like a spreadsheet, and it has like, oh, you got to fill in this box, and it's only a thousand characters, <laughs> and, um, right? And and uh, the, I, I'd say uh, the the NTSC is the opposite of that. It's like you know, here's 
<laughs> here is a, a, a lot of questions. You can fill out whatever you want. You can not fill out what you want. It can be as long as you want to yep. make it, et cetera, which I think is great. It makes it much easier to comment. And, and some of the, some of the, I'm not saying all US agencies do that. Some US agencies have mm -hmm. that approach too. But um, that uh, I'm, I'm sure for some engineers, that, that, that little box is very helpful. But for someone that's trying to give a, a fulsome viewpoint and you only care about one issue, having a hundred, yeah. you know, a thousand, characters is not very helpful so and I think it can be challenging when you, to know who the right person to contact is and actually to help decipher the complexities because I think it can be sort of potentially quite burdensome insight about how, how, how the hell can I engage with, with, with my government how can I share feedback and actually to try and make that process as simple as possible yeah I, I completely agree that's something which there's still more to be done and it's inconsistent but I think that's something which I think does help um, in, in how those things work um, I'm a bit aware so of, of time, and um, Bryony, I'd love to, you mentioned the AI work that's taking place in that kingdom. I'd love to, to hear a bit more from that, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. So I think, you know, obviously we've all heard the terrifying, scary stories about AI, um, and I think the predominant feeling in the UK is that we've, what we've got to remember is that there's a lot for good as well. And I, we, every, you know, everyone knows here about all the things that you can achieve. Um, like coding and drug discovery. I mean, in the UK government, we're very, very excited that this could solve our expenses issue because at the moment we have a very long, cumbersome process. So if, if that could fix that, that would be great. Um, but yeah, we're obviously we're very conscious of, of the risks as well. Um, I think what we're feeling is that it's akin to a lot of the 90s with the sort of explosion of the internet and not the hype and the excitement that was around that and obviously went really fast. Um, and security wasn't a uh, integral a consideration. Uh, so what we want to do, uh, going back to what I said earlier, is like let's learn from those lessons from the past, and let's make sure that when we're looking at AI, we're doing this, looking at security, and making sure it's embedded now, because otherwise it's, it's going to be really, really painful for if we have to retrofit in a, a few years' time and think about how we want to manage that. So that's what we're looking at at the moment in the UK. We've published a number of uh, papers on potential uh, regulation from DSIT, the Department of Science, Innovation and Technology. Um, we've also published on the National Cyber Security Centre's uh, website um, some principles for um, thinking about security for machine learning as well. Uh, so that's something that is, again, as for all of us, there's a lot, you know, it's going to be one of our number one priorities um, going forwards. Our Prime Minister announced when he visited DC uh, a couple of months ago that there's going to be a global uh, AI summit in the UK in the autumn. Um, that's going to be looking at safety and working with other countries about how we can think about like, building on things like the, the White House's um, recent voluntary commitments and thinking about how we can do this together. Because what we're really clear on is that we can't do it alone. We need to do this internationally. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, so I think something that's really come through as a, as a bit of a theme here um, has been the important role of, of capacity building and of um, how can we ensure that we're preparing the cyber workforce. Um, so I'd love to hear perspectives um, on that side. So Adam, is that something that you can share a bit more um, sure. on Australia? Sure, and um, so we're in the midst of developing a new strategy and um, to Ari's point, we've just gone through a consultation process and garnered about 350 responses. Uh, and as part of that, there was a recognition that Australia, if we continue with the current dynamics in terms of our workforce and our skills, we'll have a shortage of uh, uh, 46,000 people by 2026 and so in recognition of that the the government is considering a holistic approach to the way that we develop skills and a work a cyber workforce in Australia so one of the things that um, will come will likely come forth in the new strategy is a new curricula for first and secondary school students so that looks at not just cyber security but also online safety as well and and literacy the second is a, a professionalism scheme so we the feedback received was that there's not enough understanding of what are the standards to meet uh, cybersecurity skills in Australia. And the third is a recognition that there's elements of our society that we can inject into cybersecurity if we give them the opportunity to return to work through schemes that will work for migrants, uh, mothers returning from work, or, um, or other people who might be returning from a disability, etc. So there's kind of three key elements to the, the, the cyber and skills conversation, uh, sorry, the workforce and skills conversation in, in Australia at the moment. Yeah, I, I, talked, I talked a little bit about the, the skills thing, so I won't, I won't uh, repeat any of that. The only, the only other element in the Cybersecurity Act, which I should 
uh, touch on. It's been added by the Parliament. It wasn't origin in the original um, Commission draft text. Is uh, increase in funding and support for the European Cybersecurity Agency and ESA, and particularly for its work on developing its sort of the uh, cybersecurity um, community practice and of um, uh, of, of facilitating the um, the exchange of competences with the national um, cybersecurity centres. As I say, cybersecurity isn't an EU competence, so that's why we, we have to sort of dance around the legislation a little bit in terms of doing this. But there was pretty much um, universal support for the idea of you know, not ENISA taking over from the national um, cybersecurity centres. That's never going to happen. We just don't have that capacity. But improving the uh, exchange of experiences and looking at, again, standards, um, sticks, taxi, and others uh, for uh, information, you know, rapid information exchange on uh, new exposed uh, vulnerabilities or attacks, and, and being able to improve that in an environment which is, you've got to remember, the European Union's 27 countries, European Parliament's made up of 700 members from 107 national political parties working in 23 languages where the legislation that's implemented is implemented in those 23 languages. So, uh, you know, excuse a little bit if things are sometimes a bit complicated, but at, even at this level, you know, everything working on cybersecurity at a national level, English may be the lingua franca for a lot of operations and a lot of stuff, but you cannot impose that on a country like Romania or Serbia or um, um, Estonia, uh, that their workforce exclusively work in English. So you've got to provide that competence also on a multilingual basis, and I think that's the other thing. The only final element I'd mention is, and I touched on it when I talked about um, election integrity, and that is there's a call from a recent report of the European Parliament on um, election interference and foreign interference, is a call to the member states to make election systems part of, uh, classify them as critical infrastructure, which is not the case at the moment. So I think the only thing I would add as a wide consideration for us for the, the next year is going to be looking at cyber skills. Uh, so for us in the UK, it's, you know, there's no point in us talking about, you know, increasing resilience of critical national infrastructure, looking at the threat if we just don't have the people to, to do it. Um, currently in the UK, we have a gap of uh, 11,000 jobs and our cyber workforce has grow, uh, needs to grow by 50% um, over the last four years. So is it, we're in a, you know, we're, there is a bit of a tight spot. Uh, so what we're really clear and what we want to do for, for um, young people and to people you know, mid-career mid or any point in their career is have a really clear visualization of what a career in cybersecurity looks like. So you know, we talk about teachers, we talk about lawyers, you know, children who want to, to do something like that. At the moment, there isn't a clear career path if you want to become a cyber professional. So over the last two years, we have worked really closely with industry and a number of other partners to think about how do we create a clear career path for the people who want to get into cyber. Uh, so that has led to the creation of the Cyber Security Advisory Council, uh, which is an umbrella organisation um, working with lots of different partners to create that career path. Um, we're not saying, you know, there's still a long way to go and we're still doing a lot of consultation. There's currently 16 uh, different specialisms within the Cybersecurity um, Council. There are different areas of uh, accreditation, but what it take, tries to take is a holistic, looking at all the different things that you can do to qualify in cyber. So someone who did, like for myself, did a linguistics degree, you know, it's making sure that we can value all the different things that, you know, that, that people bring to the table on cyber and making sure that you, that is recognised, but also creating that clear pathway and creating creating um, a clear visualisation for what people want to do by working in cyber. And Ari, I, mean, I think you, you mentioned earlier about the you know, consultation deluges. Um, it would be great to hear a bit more about what you'd like to see more of, um, maybe from, from what you've seen some countries do really well um, in addition to that, and then what maybe you think that we should be doing more to help us get to that capacity issue a bit sooner. Yeah, I mean, the capacity issue is hard. We have it, I mean, it's everywhere, right? It's not, yep. it's in the, in the developed countries and the non-developed countries. And uh, I think, you know, from my point of view, a lot of that has been that we have to get uh, much more, think about getting more, much more diversity into uh, the structure. I mean, one of the things that the UK has done is they had this effort to bring, like, uh, um, I, th I forget what grade level it would be here, but uh, girls are at a certain grade level. They have a competition, only girls can enter. And, 
uh, on, on, on uh, tech skills that leads to, towards cybersecurity and um, I have a challenge for them and uh, uh, had a ton of participation, ton, ton, ton participation and got national write-ups and things like that. I think we need to do a lot more of that, but that's like planning 10 years out, right? Mm -hmm. so, like, and I think that might be the path. Um, we do have, you know, we, there is this kind of challenge, you're talking about AI, right? And you have the, the idea of like, we're gonna automate a lot more of security. And at the same time, like we wanna get more people into these jobs who then their jobs might disappear um, as well. So I think that there is a, a little bit of a challenge on that side of it. Uh, but the, uh, I mean, there, is, there are still so many uh, cybersecurity jobs right now. I mean, the, the, what, what, what Peter was saying in terms of the number of open, of, of open uh, vacancies. If you look at the, um, what we have in the U.S. on the, the, the CyberSeq um, uh, page that, they put, that, that uh, NICE puts together at NIST, um, they have, I think it, it is, uh, um, the, the number of open jobs is equal to the number of people in that, that are qualified for those jobs. <laughs> So if everyone switched, obviously, you'd have all the other new jobs open up, right? So it is not like it's just a we have to bring down the number of jobs. Yeah, and automation can help with that to some degree. We also have to get a diver more people into the workforce that diversifies the workforce um, and think more differently about who those people are. And it might mean thinking 10 years down the road in order to get enough people to do that uh, and to, to bring those kind of challenges because you're not going to just, you know, the, the other key to that, this is a lot of those jobs aren't the entry level jobs, right? If you look at the, the job categories, uh, most of them need three to five years experience as, a, um, as the baseline. So how do you get three to five years experience, right? So there's a, there is a lot of this discussion about the, uh, um, apprenticeships and things like that in order to get there, but um, we gotta think a lot more creatively because that's apprenticeships are hard to scale, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just any other points that people like to raise on the skills agenda before we move on? So just what Ari just mentioned regarding our Cyber First Girls uh, competition, which is, well, thank you for your very kind comments, Ari, um, because yeah, they, we're really proud of the Cyber First competition, and it's about aged girls so age 13, and uh, they do a coding competition over the summer. And it's, it's, it's it, so what we see is this point where in the UK, that's where um, you choose your next stage of education, which can dictate what you know, A-levels you do, and which university you go to. So it really is, is a real determining point. Quite terrifying, you have to make that as well, age 13, 14, but you know, there you go. Um, but what we're seeing is a lot of girls drop off from um, you know, a cyber sort of topics at that age. So, that, so this is why that competition is age, uh, aimed at that age to try and tackle that. Um, the only other thing I would say is some of the, the programs we have, we're starting to see some uh, results. So they've been in program uh, progress for about this last seven, eight years, and we're now seeing some of those people who have went to these competitions at age 13 now coming as into interns into the Department of Science and Innovation and Technology. You know, we're talking small numbers, but it's a, re it's a really good sign. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Peter, just before, um, before we go to questions, um, Peter, you mentioned briefly, and feel free to not answer if you can't, but um, you were talking about the, the importance of elections and the election security component. I'd love to hear any more input you have on that side. Yeah, I mean, I don't, for this audience, I don't think anyone needs reminding about some of the challenges that we see in elections already with deep fakes, whether video or audio, um, but also um, the way that social media is being used and driven by increasing the automated systems which are bought by, um, let's say, uh, either state or non-state actors, you know, off-the-shelf um, sort of um, disinformation or um, interference um, capacities. Um, the Parliament's approach has been, we, we, we had a special committee set up for um, a year and a half on looking at foreign interference and uh, election integrity. And some of the issues were sort of pointing, not just pointing the finger at, at uh, online platforms, but sort of saying, you know, you guys have got to, you've got to pull your weight a little bit in terms of um, trying to either, to ban is un unrealistic, but to call on them to rein in um, the possibility for advertisers to do sort of micro-targeted um, political campaigning. So even in a particular electoral district, to be able, using AI, a, a malign actor would be able to target 
um, an audience of a, a, a thousand Facebook users, for example, in, in one constituency, each with a very different message based on the information and data available to them. And to do that, to do that well, that's what political campaigning is about, to do that nefariously and to put out um, misinformation or lies, knowing that one person is going to be more susceptible to something which is claimed in one area where a, another person would not. That sort of micro-targeting is something which we're very concerned about. Um, we are calling on um, the online platforms to take more seriously and more rapid action on takedown of misinformation where it's clear, not misinformation, disinformation, to, be, be, to, to, to clarify the terminology, um, where it's known that there are actors that are clearly be behaving in a way of, 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 of uh, uh, promoting false information online. I, I mentioned about the integrity of election systems and them being considered as um, critical infrastructure. Um, the other area which I think is, it, it may be marginal interest, but um, protection of journalists and of in what, we, what we, we're talking about introducing so-called mirror clauses whereby we will provide um, access to non-European journalists in reciprocity of the openness of other third countries to do the same for us. So if you are faced with a country which has a very tightly controlled media where there are no journalists or foreign journalists have very limited access to information, well, it's going to be a tit for tat and you, you can expect to get more limited access to, um, as, a, as a journalist from those countries to, uh, to the political space that we have. Um, I think a lot of that is, a lot of people talk about AI and I think AI is going to be one of the critical aspects in terms of um, uh, where we are and we have the whole AI Act and I'm not going to go into any of the details about, uh, about that. But this issue, whether it's for us operation in the parliament to have sort of transparency or insight to how algorithms are being used um, for a service that we may buy in off the shelf to help some of our internal work, to know that it's that the, that the service is reliable, that it has high level of integrity, that the, the data sources being used or whatever are, uh, are known, that there isn't data poisoning upstream before the algorithms or the language models are being used or deployed. These are all issues about uh, transparency which have a clear relationship to the whole world of cybersecurity because you want, to, you want to keep the integrity of that whole chain of training data, operational data, synthetic data or whatever coming through. Um, those models before um, providing sort of decision support. And whether that's in terms of our operational systems, whether that's in terms of what gets pushed out in uh, mass media or um, online in social media, um, that interface between cybersecurity challenges and AI, I think, is going to be an increasingly uh, a headache for us in the, in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd love to hear any questions that we may have as well. So please do feel free. There's a microphone here. We'd like to, if anyone would like to come join. Yes, please. Apologies, it'll be a little long-winded, but I promise there's a question. I wanted to hit on a couple points that you talked about, especially as it comes to two issues that are kind of related in, in the way that they have their impacts in their respective ways, and that's the kind of implication of enforcing a national or international, at whatever level, cybersecurity policy on small businesses. Uh, and also kind of conflated with a separate issue, and that's uh, what we spoke about as far as uh, Mexico not having the expertise to develop their own uh, cybersecurity policy or to implement that cybersecurity policy. Looking at, for example, Africa and developing into a, a more modern uh, internet-connected world. Um, kind of the similar impact on small businesses applies to smaller countries. For example, complying with GDPR. Uh, is a challenge for small businesses as well as it is for smaller countries to comply with those kind of internationalized cybersecurity policies. So taking into account, for example, the geopolitics of Russian and Chinese influence as it comes to Africa and being able to knowledge transfer to smaller countries and smaller businesses how to comply with those cybersecurity policies, what do you see as the most feasible solutions for us to be able to kind of prevent conflating national security with cybersecurity and be able to share that information and that knowledge with smaller businesses and countries to not impose a greater cost on them to comply? So a lot of countries um, have actually have kind of like the minimus rules. So Japan and their privacy law 
came up with a, you know, this is the minimum amount of information you collect and, or, and also here's the number of like how small like your income is and et cetera and kind of has some degree of changing that based on that. Obviously you don't want, just because it, someone doesn't make a lot of money or only has a couple employees but collects information on the entire world, uh, you don't want to like totally get rid of everything. So yeah, there is a balance there, especially in the privacy uh, discussion. But I do think that it is, uh, your point about um, the separation between national security and um, uh, cybersecurity is a good one and having an understanding of like the impact, like the broader impact that you're having on the economy when you come up with these rules and how do you go about it affecting uh, small businesses and keeping that into, a, a, in, into account as you make the policy. And you know, one of the things we hear a lot from the EU is, don't worry about it, we don't have it in the, in the regulation, but we're, I mean, we don't have it in the, but when we, put, when we have the, uh, what's it called, the implementing language, right? It'll be in the implementing language, this, this issue. And a lot of the small business stuff that we have raised with the EU, they say, you know, wait for the implementing language. Um, I can't say that makes the small businesses I've spoken to that understand what the CRA is going to do very, uh, like, doesn't mollify them. But um, I do think that there is something to be said about, like, you know, sometimes if we can get, um, as we get into more details um, and, and that, uh, um, you know, the people with expertise that are writing it, you know, can go into more detail there and then don't have to worry about, you know, what that, like every, like this becoming a thousand page regulation in the first place, right? So, but the implementing language can deal with it. So um, I think that there is, has been some more effort to deal with small businesses and kind of like what, what we would consider to be the regulated, regulation language and, and uh, the EU would consider to be the implementing language, so. Thank you. So, yeah. Actually, in the CRA there is, in the primary legislation, there is direct reference to small businesses with certain exemptions in terms of how um, how they implement, but also support for small businesses, for example, to to engage in the standardisation or conformity assessment processes or whatever, and giving them a sort of a bit of a leg up. Um, the other element, and this is a more controversial one, but I think it can't be ignored. Many of the European Union countries are col former colonial powers. Um, Britain, well, Britain's no longer in the EU, unfortunately, but, you know, France, Germany, Netherlands, Spain, Portugal, Italy, you know, little Belgium, where I, I'm a national, um, they're all former colonial powers. And the reason that's important is because they still have strong links with those former, former colonies and those countries, which are now independent countries. And there's a very strong political and administrative culture of cooperation with those countries on a bilateral basis and multilateral basis. And I don't think that can be ignored in terms of the support that they can provide indirectly to, um, to, to those countries through their bilateral uh, efforts. And the final element, though, I'd mention is I, I, I touched on this Trade and Technology Council, which is a sort of jamboree of the, the big wigs of, of, in trade and technology policy between the EU and the US. But they have launched a number of um, small pilot projects for um, support um, in various technology areas for third-party countries. I think the current ones are Senegal, um, Jamaica, Sierra Leone, and there was a fourth country, where there are particular projects, whether it's in supporting um, 5G um, implementation in remote areas to improve infrastructure for, uh, for, for learning and for schools, but coupling that with cybersecurity uh, capability to ensure that that's not going to get taken over and, uh, by, by, by some uh, malign force to uh, undermine the whole project. But so there are, there are, there are various avenues. And I, I would say, in addition to which, the European Union treaties specifically have a, um, a provisions for small businesses. So it's, it's sort of baked into the treaties in terms of, of, of how the European Union works. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a really good point. In fact, um, and we run this, this group called LATAM CISO, which is made up of uh, you know, 250 of the uh, chief information security officers in Latin America. And the annual conference this year is actually gonna be in Spain. And the reason for that is not the Spanish government is excited to have it, but it was really Telefonica that's excited to have it there. And it's to bring in, I mean, some of these are small businesses. They wanna fly them over there and they wanna, like it's, it's actually not the government as much as the, as, as the yeah, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the telecommunications company, the large telecommunications companies from some of these, from these, from the, uh, 
former uh, colonizer, right, that is uh, engaged in working with them, et cetera. And we see that with U.S. companies, too. A lot of the U.S. companies want to engage with them and kind of give support to some of the smaller companies there and uh, get them to buy their products uh, or get the governments to uh, support them buying their products. So um, I think that, that uh, there is something to that and in, in terms of helping boost it, uh, even from the government, from the, from the, uh, from the, uh, from the companies involved in the space or the pseudo, uh, in, in some cases, the pseudo, uh, you know, when, when you have a telecom, a lot of times it's a joint, jointly run, so. Yeah. And just from my side, so I have three points on, on the, thank you for the question. Um, I think that, um, first of all, there is a clear distinction between like national security and digital security as the complexities within that, and something that the OECD does, because of course there's international organizations have mandates, and so the, the OECD, it doesn't look at national security because there are other organizations that engage on that basis. So they work at security within the digital economy, which is looking at vulnerabilities that help to if exploited, can underpin digital security. Now, of course, I recognise that there is the Venn diagram is not two separate bubbles, um, but you know it, there is an active decision to think, well, how can we how can we do that? And I think a benefit of do, doing that from my side is that it helps to diffuse the conversation about transparency, about sharing information, because you can say, I don't care about the sort of the national security stuff, but we do need to track how much you're boosting resilience, and a helpful way to diffuse that is to focus on the digital security component. Um, another thing that I'd probably talk about is the, the, the talk about smaller countries. Again, the OECD has 38 member states um, and produces recommendations that are then shared with and used quite often by those countries that are middle income and also accession countries, so like the Brazils of this world, and, and, um, which, who are sort of looking to the outputs from those organizations and saying, well, how can we look to use these as, as starters for the, how we look to introduce policies? Um, on a sort of purely very sort of very specific point, um, on IoT security, um, when the UK government introduced the Product Security Telecommunications Infrastructure Act, um, prior to doing so, we placed a, we actually created a grant scheme which was supporting businesses um, to meet minimum requirements and actually to to look at how they can implement the better security practices within their products. And because we recognised that, like actually. There was the optimistic viewpoint that most manufacturers wanted to do good, but maybe just didn't know how. So we created a grant, a grant um, which supported the development of assurance schemes across connected televisions um, and also smart connected toys, because that's a bit more motive, and also um, uh, just a, a self-assessment self framework that manufacturers could then use, and that then came with free training that was available. Um, so it, it, it's not like a perfect solution, but it was something which government, you know, helpful to prioritise and thinking through how are you making sure that you are not, you know, you're, you're balancing the carrot and stick, so supporting manufacturers, particularly those at the smaller end, where you do want to generate the, in, the innovation. And I think, you know, the UK's use of ARIA is a really, it's a great ex example of, you know, taking the model from DARPA and looking to how we can amplify it. You know, it's a really helpful scheme there as well. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, any other points on the panel? Quick question, yes. <laughs> Thank you all for doing this panel. I know most of you. Um, as a former U.S. government of cyber officials, it's really great to hear much, how much commonality there is in the approaches that your governments are taking. But you know, as we see increasingly malicious authoritarian cyber attacks by authoritarian governments and increasingly uh, debilitating ransomware attacks, the private sector plays a key role developing new capabilities. We have new programs like bug bounties that help get at you know, identifying vulnerabilities. As you look to the future, what do you think, what are you most optimistic about in the way that the private sector can assist in doing cybersecurity? Because we've talked a lot about what governments can do, you know, cybersecurity strategies, workforce development, but what are the things that you really want the private sector to, you know, launch on that can really help the governments protect their citizens? Thanks. I mean, Brian, you talked about uh, how this is, everyone's in this together. I think that's totally true and that, the, that we have seen, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, there is the kind of, well, we need um, companies to do better in terms of uh, securing their code, et cetera. But also, I, I do think that the companies are the ones that come up with the solutions, right? I mean, the, most of the solutions in this space don't come from uh, governments that say, oh, here's, here's how we can, here's what we need to implement in order to make this happen. I mean, look at, uh, even CSRB that just put out this new uh, report, the, the Cybersecurity Review Board, on the lapsus, the first thing on there is FIDO, right? The governments didn't create FIDO. Companies created FIDO. That's a standard that then is implemented by companies. So 
I mean, almost every solution comes out of, you know, uh, co companies coming together, addressing an issue, um, you know, and then that leads to it being standardized and then that you kind of have the policies that come over, well, we should implement this because there's a standard out there to do it. Um, which is one of the reasons that I think there is some frustration from the way that Europe basically says, well, we need to come up with a European standard first. Well, the reason you know it's a problem is because there was a standard out there already and people aren't implementing it, not because we need a new European standard, right? Um, so I think that that, that, uh, that is exactly the kind of like, the, the, we need to be able to get these standards. We, we, need, we need to get that structure from, okay, we have a solution, and we need to standardize the solution, we need to make, internationalize that, and we have to get governments to accept that, happen faster um, than it does today. Uh, but it's getting, it is already pretty efficient of a, sh of a system if we can get people, the, the, the problem is more to getting the people to actually implement it or you know, creating the structure in which people are forced to implement it. So. Thank you, uh, Rob. I was saying, I mean, the short answer is we need to work on everything together. Well, this is, you know, this is, we have to work hand in glove. And in the UK, we have lots of initiatives, like public-private partnerships is obviously uh, a buzzword of today, but the, the Industry 100 program we have, the information exchanges we have with our critical national infrastructure partners, with the charity sector, with academia, it's, it, it's everything, it's absolutely at the core of everything we do, and we take it really seriously. I think what, for me, is just we have to make it as easy as possible for industry. <laughs> like you want to do, you know, obviously you've got your day jobs as well, and it's, we just need to make it really clear and, and as actionable for you as possible. Thanks for the question, Rob. Um, yeah, probably a bit more difficult from a European Union perspective. We're the ones who you've always, always seen as sort of taking a sort of sledgehammer approach to, to industry. Um, innovation. Uh, we, you know, there's lots of talk about, so, you know, there's innovation, there's regulation, they're opposed to each other, you can't innovate if there's too much regulation, you can't. I, I think it's a bit of a BS uh, dichotomy. Um, the, the famous phrase, what is it, um, you know, necess necessity is the mother of invention. Um, when GDPR was being discussed, we had a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback, saying, oh, this isn't possible, nobody can do this, do this. And the very cynical amongst the, the parliament at the time sort of said, you innovate, you, you're always claiming you can innovate, go innovate, go and find a new model, instead of just sort of pimping off um, people's private data in order to make your money, go find another way of, uh, of making money. And people did innovate, and we now have very thriving business around <laughs> privacy protection, and a lot of businesses have made a, a, a lot of money out of that. Um, so I think there is, I mean, that's, that's one extreme uh, view. I don't, personally, I don't necessarily share that. Um, but I think innovation um, has to, there has to be incentives. And I think to say, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, go out and innovate, so that's, that's fine in practice. But if you're in an environment where innovation is rewarded, and that's clearly the sort of US um, sort of free market model, which, which it makes uh, it very, very attractive, then the Europeans shouldn't be so surprised that some of that innovation moves to the US. I mean, UK, France, Germany, we had thriving IT infrastructure industries or whatever through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We didn't innovate in those, and we didn't invest in those, and today, those, a lot of those industries have, have, have drifted away. So I think there's a more fundamental problem in terms of providing the incentives to industry to be able to come up with the sort of responses you're talking about. And I think that that imbalance between the innovation response and the incentives, I think, is the core issue. I don't have a magic wand, I don't have an obvious solution to that, but I think that's where the, that's where the, the real problem lies. Uh, so, it's, sorry, three points from me. So I think the, I'm most optimistic about uh, the manner in which we're moving towards a more collaborative environment with um, industry on, on threat sharing and threat blocking and certainly the JCD construct here while still nascent I think is something that we're looking at very closely in Australia and see if we can triage that to work within the five eyes to do something similar. The other element to um, the innovation point is around building sovereign capability with the Australian government where there are incentives to do so and then also potentially working with the or within the AUKUS framework um, to develop those, those uh, 
high-end technologies that we will all need for the competition that's coming. The last point, and to that, um, that issue as well, is working with the quad partners and the ability to bring industry into the, into the dialogue there because the quad, which is India, Japan, Australia, and the United States, has a huge economic uh, heft behind it. 28% of the world's GDP sits within that, those four countries. So the ability of, to shape and set standards is, will be pivotal through that. Bringing industry into that conversation is, is crucial. Can I just say thank you all very much for the questions. Um, and can I also thank you very much for our panel. Um, so thank you, Ari, thank you, Brian, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Adam. And thank you all uh, for joining. Um, we will be around, around and available um, for some time if you'd like to have some conversations uh, following the, the panel. Um, but thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.